Hello, everyone. Uh, so, first of all, I'm giving this talk in English, uh, but I'm happy to take uh, questions in German afterwards. This is this is for the stream. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm sure you you saw the title already, and you're thinking, uh, what? Why why would a doorbell need a firewall? That's it's like the last thing that you think about securing. So. This is what I'm here to talk about today. So first of all, what? Um, so I'll explain how I how I got into this and um, what what I found out. Uh, then I'll tell you how how things can magically work and what's behind the magic. And then we'll look at what these things are used for what they could be used for by somebody with some evil streak and a bit of imagination, and how we can protect ourselves. So, what, why? Uh, well, there's two reasons I'm, I'm doing this, and of course the first one is fun, and the second one is profit. So, um, a customer of mine that, uh, that makes um, some household electronics, I'll leave it at that, uh, wanted a remote activation possibility for their device. And uh, this was a bit problematic because we'd already gone through regulatory approvals of all sorts and adding a radio to an already approved device is a bit of a mess. So we figured out, okay, how can we do this very cheaply and without having to actually like approve a radio transmitter? So I figured, okay, there's uh, there's all sorts of devices that are very cheap, already on the market, already approved, and uh, wireless. So can we just hack one of those and use that as an activation? So we settled on radio doorbells, which are they're very cheap. Uh, there's uh, there's two main frequencies that they run on: three hundred and fifteen megahertz and four hundred thirty-three point nine. And um, in the end, we ended up using 315 because uh, that's, that's what was more available. Yeah, but first of all, I, I got one and I looked into it and tried to figure out how it works. Right, so there's the transmitter on the left there, there's the receiver on the right there, and there's some very cheap mass-produced magic in between. So looking inside, this is what you have. You have a speaker, you have the receiver board, and those two wires go to the battery. And this is a close-up, and this is the other side. So there's, there's two major components on this one. On the right there is the radio circuitry, which is extremely, extremely simple. Um, Basically, all it does is it resonates at the specific frequency, and anything that's at that frequency, it amplifies, and anything that isn't, it rejects. And all the magic is on that little green board over there, which is a decoder and tone generator. So what I did was I, I attached my oscilloscope probe to various points on that and just found the signal that changes level when when a signal is received. So that's fine. Job done, right? Project over. Yeah, I can, I can finish here. Okay, but of course I didn't. So I picked another one. Here's a... So this one is about four euros on the market. So you, you can get that for four euros. So there's, there's really nothing fancy or expensive in there. And that's with batteries, right? Uh, this one is much, much fancier. You can get that for about seven euros. So this one actually has a separate decoder chip. And you could look up its data sheet and uh, it's apparently a remote decoder, decoder circuit, which is a clone of, uh, it's, it's a Chinese clone of, I believe, a Panasonic product originally. So it has uh, the two interesting things on it. It has a data input pin, which is, uh, let me see if I can show you on there. 
14 would be so that's so it has a data input pin over here and it has the output over here so I decided to have a bit of a look at these signals and this is what comes in on the input and now on the left there you can see it the um, the top there's um, the bottom is a zoomed in version of the top so at the top you have all these random transitions which is noise and then you have these blocks of fast transitions and that's where the signal is so if you look at that a bit more closely so you have noise here on the left and then you have really regularly spaced transitions going up um, and th that is probably a clock of some kind and then it goes down at different times. So you have uh, you have these short signals, the three short signals on the left, and a long signal, and another three short signals, then another long signal, then three short signals, another long signal, a short signal, a long signal. This is basically Morse code, right? Except the high-tech version of it. It's very, very easy to decode. So we can recover the signal by just measuring the times at which the blue marks over there are, so the times when the clock goes up, and then compare, to, compare that to the times when it goes down. So if it goes down between, like before the middle point of, of the two clocks, it's a zero, and if it goes low after the middle point, then it's a one. And here's the code to do that. This is, this is just an Arduino interrupt. Uh, do you want me to go through this or should I just leave it and give you a link later? Who wants me to go through it? One, two, three, four, okay, enough people. Okay, so um, we have, uh, this is triggered every time the pin level changes. Um, so we store the time at which the change happened and then if, if, it went, if it went high, then it's a clock bit, and if it went low, it's a data bit. So if it's a clock bit, we, we save the interval, um, which is the time difference between this clock and the previous clock. And if that interval matches the previous interval, so it's within, within 10 microseconds of the, of the previous interval, then it's a valid clock. So then we increase the counter and we shift the message left. So we make space for the, for the next bit. And if the clock is not valid, then that's the end of the message. So uh, I'm ignoring short messages here because you get a lot of noise that looks like a valid clock. So I'm ignoring everything that has less than four bits. And I set the flag here so that whatever code is running in the main loop can, can deal with this. And if we have a data bit, so we, uh, this, uh, this right shift here is the same as a division by two. So we have our clock period here, and we divide that by two, and if the current time <clears throat> is more than that, then it's a one, and if it's less than that, then it's a zero. Um, I'll give you a link to this code later on. So if you want to look at it. Okay, so we have three, three data points that we can get out of this. So we have the time between, between each clock bit. We have the length of the message, how many clock bits uh, there were. And then we have the content of the message. And using these three, we, can, we have um, a unique signature for each transmitter. So... Um, Transmitters from the same manufacturer will usually have same clock period, same clock length, and different messages. Uh, so you can, you can identify different manufacturers of devices, you can identify different types of devices, and um, depending on the code length, uh, you can also identify how expensive the device is. So there's, there's some that actually advertise a very long, especially secure code. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, it's just more bits. 
Anyway, so what if I don't have a doorbell? You, you can get, this is a, a transceiver, so a transmitter on top and a receiver on the bottom. They're tiny, they're really cheap. That's like five euros with shipping for the two of them. And of course, if we have a transmitter, that means we can, we can replicate these messages and we can just pretend to be any, any device that we've seen so far. And there's, there's absolutely no security of any kind here, right? So like I, I can record someone's doorbell and then play that back and it will ring. And I can do that any number of times and it will, it will work. So we can receive signals, we can decode signals, we can generate and transmit them, and we can identify them. Right, so what? It's a doorbell, right? Who cares? Yeah, okay, so if we look at what these, these chips, these decoder chips, are actually used in, we find, of course, doorbells, right? Um, also, uh, if you've ever been to one of these shops where you go in and it makes a horrible sound, so they're used in those too. So doorbells, annoyance generators. <laughs> yeah, they're used in remote control toys. <laughs> okay, so far, nothing too bad, right? You wouldn't worry too much about securing these things. They might get annoying, but then again, if you, if you ever buy one of these uh, cheap remote controlled light switches or, or power outlets, they, they will use the same code. And I'm sure there's now gears turning in your head, like what, what can we do if we can remote control someone's, someone's lamps and power switches? Okay, we'll get there. But then um, I, looked at, I looked at the actual manufacturer recommendation on what you should be using these, these parts for. And um, <laughs> intrusion sensors, motion detectors, remote home security, industrial remote control, garage doors, what? <laughs> Network smoke detectors, car security. What? Seriously? Like, how can you use an unsecured, completely repeatable code that you can reproduce with, with five euros worth of equipment for security? It's ridiculous. So I figured, okay, that can't possibly be right. Maybe that's, that's what the manufacturer is imagining, but it can't possibly be right. So I, I tested with a car key and whew, it uses a slightly different method. Okay. so. Um, first of all, the encoder, the encoding is different. So it uses Manchester encoding, which is uh, the same <coughs> encoding that you use for, for serial parts. Uh, but that's equally easy to decode, really. But then it uses something called a rolling code, which means every time you send the code, it gets deactivated. So you can't send that code again. So, okay, there's at least a little bit more security. But there's still, there's still issues because um, this rolling code is not synchronized both ways. So uh, the car lock only knows the next set of codes that are likely to come. Uh, and the key, the key transmitter, is just cycling through codes. Uh, which means if, uh, if the lock uh, has not heard the transmission, you can replay it and you can use it to, to unlock the car. And this works. So you, you can record, you can record a, a car key fob where the car cannot hear it, where it's out of range, and then replay it next to the car and it will unlock. Because from its point of view, it hasn't seen that code before, so it must be valid, right? Yeah, and also, um, if if that was the only if that was the only check, then um, pressing the button accidentally would mean that you could never unlock your car again. And obviously, this is not the case. So in fact, the lock is looking for a set of codes, sometimes up to five hundred and twelve of them, 
uh, that are the next ones that are likely to come. Which means, if you press the button 512 times, it will no longer work. <laughs> okay. Right, so this is, this is okay for um, uh, like these, these car keys which have an extra fob, but there's, there's already cars that no longer have a key at all, so the fob is the only way to unlock it. So if you just, if you just activate it enough times, it will, it, you can lock people out of their car. Great. And of course, um, these things, even if you, if you don't know the code, if you don't know what the correct code is, they still have the signature of uh, clock rate and message length. So you can identify different car manufacturers just by the transmission. So, okay, this is what they're used for. So what could somebody that, that is of a somewhat evil mind actually use them for? Um, so this, this is written on pretty much every cheap radio device. It has this FCC part 15 notice, <laughs> which includes this text. This device must accept any interference received, including interference that may cause undesired operation. So that got me thinking, what kind of undesired operation can we, can we get to? So here's the broad categories, right? So you can annoy people. You can spy on people, you can prevent people from using their stuff, or you can use it for crime. So harassment is the easiest thing to think of. So you can, yeah, you can ring someone's doorbell at night, right? That's, I must say at this point, um, I live in a building with very thick walls. There are excellent radio insulators, and we have a wired doorbell, which of course is on a on a bus, which means I can ring all my neighbors' doorbells without having to use radio. But my neighbors are nice. I don't do this to them. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you can imagine the fun someone would have if their smoke alarm goes goes on at night and the random intervals, and preferably just when they've gone to bed, which you can notice because they've remotely switched off their lights. <laughs> yeah. Or you can, you can just make someone believe that they're seeing things. Yeah. Um, about surveillance. So, in the worst case, when somebody's using wireless everything, so you know, you know when somebody's visiting them because they ring their doorbell. You know when they're at home because their lights are on. Uh, you know when their house is on fire. Now this is not very evil, this is actually a good idea. Knowing when your neighbor's house is on fire is actually a very, very good idea. So this, this I think is the only legitimate application that I'm presenting in this whole talk. Um, yeah, you can, you can know when people are unlocking their car. Even if you can't do the, the replay attack uh, because they're in range, you can, you can identify which, which model it is. And by that, you can sort of build a profile. Like this person's car has this many bits at, at this rate, and this person's car has that many at that rate. So you can know who is unlocking their car when. So just with the directional antenna, you can be the NSA slash Stasi of your street with five euros of investment, right? Right, denial of service. Uh, these signals are not secured in any way. I said this before, but I'm repeating it. So it's very, very easy to interfere with them. So you can, you can detect the starting clock bit, the first, uh, the first three transitions, uh, and then you can just transmit noise on top of that. And if you're transmitting noise that's, um, that's at the same frequency, uh, um, okay, so, I, I need to go back a bit. So the way these transmitters work and the way they are so cheap is that the only thing that the code does is switch the transmitter on and off. So if it's quiet, that's, that's like the low level. And if it's not quiet, that's a high level, which means if you transmit noise, it's high all the time and uh, the clock is lost and the, the receiver cannot recover it. So you can trivially block a transmission. 
Um, and there's also no error correction. So you can, if you're transmitting louder, you can transmit a different code. Um, you can only change zeros to ones. You can't change ones to zeros, but already you can do, you can do a lot with that. Um, and the only error correction that this has is that it ignores things if they're not repeated often enough. So if, if you can block enough transmissions or if you repeat your own signal often enough, it's accepted with, with absolutely no checksumming or anything else. And with rolling codes, I already mentioned the, the denial of service attack where you just press the button enough times and it no longer works. Right, um, and the criminal applications of this, I think at this point should be obvious. I mean, if somebody's stupid enough to have a garage door secured by just this, then anybody can trivially gain entry. Right, so why is it so bad? First of all, these things, um, um, those, those PCBs I showed you, they were bought last year and they were manufactured in, the newest one was manufactured in 2004. So this is old stuff. And as long as it works, and as long as nobody's complaining, it's not going to change because you can always resell your old stuff more cheaply than designing something new. Um, and it's cheap. And you, you can imagine um, a cryptographic uh, protection system with this, where the transmitter uh, sends, out, um, sends out a challenge, gets a response with a challenge back and responds to that. And that way, even if you could, even if you could intercept the communication or replay it, that wouldn't work. Except as a man in the middle attack, of course. But um, the thing is, even a cryptographic processor costs incredibly much. It's like a euro and a half. And that's, that's twice what the material cost of these things are. So there's no way you can, you can fit that in the same budget. It would double the price. And of course, nobody actually gives a shit about security. So... We could do better, but we really have to want to. We have to be willing to pay more than twice the cost for, for these things. And this is cheap mass-produced magic. It's not going to happen. So there are ways to protect ourselves. So, of course, the easiest way to protect yourself is don't broadcast your data. So don't use stuff that transmits your data in a completely unsecured way. But sometimes we have to. Sometimes there's, uh, there's no better option. So if you have to do it, do it quietly. So um, by lowering the voltage on the transmitter, uh, it transmits in, with a small range. So you, you can limit the range in which, uh, in which the signal can be recovered. Of course, if you have a nice directional antenna, you can, you can still recover it, but you have to know where to point it to. So if you have to do it loud, that is over a long distance, do it as little as you can. So keep the transmitter off whenever possible and um, have some shielding. So if you're in a place with thick walls, that, that already solves the problem. And if you have to do it loud in public, you have to be aware of the risks. So use devices that you've verified yourself to be secure or none at all. And don't trust the manufacturer because seriously, the manufacturer of that decoder chip actually wanted people to use it to unlock their cars. Seriously, it's like that's, that's a recommended application. Okay, so um, I'm going to use a bit of time now for some shameless promotion, and then I'm going to take questions. Right, so shameless promotion. Um, uh, 
the only place that I heard about 1C2 from was the Ding Public, which is an absolutely awesome hack space um, over in, in Nippus. And if you haven't been there, you should go check it out. And it's open to non-members every Friday night, and it's open to members always. So if you didn't know about it, you do now, and it's a really cool place, go check it out. And I also have some shameless self-promotion to do. So I do custom electronics, mechanics, automation, and embedded software. <laughs> Reverse engineering as well, if necessary, and general fun stuff. Um, I will charge you double to triple for anything closed source. And this is my contact information. Um, and I'll take questions now. Anyone? Yes, um, first I think we should applause uh, for Clement because it was, I think, really interesting and uh, yeah, maybe a bit scary. Uh, and I ask everybody to keep your seats until the question answer is over. We have about a quarter of an hour now for the questions and answers. The first question was there and I come to you. Um, in English or German? Egal. Okay, um, ich habe zwei Fragen und zwar erste Frage ist, wie hast du den Dekodierungscode rausgefunden? Und die zweite Frage ist, um, du hast gesagt, man kann keine Nullen produzieren. Gibt es nicht auch sowas wie Interferenzen, mit denen man aus einer einzelnen Null machen kann? Also ein Gegensignal steuern? Wäre das möglich? Okay, also dieser Dekodierungscode, das zeige ich noch mal. <lacht> Wenn ich mal dazu komme. Du meinst dem, ne? Das, das ist jetzt aufgrund von diesem Prinzip geschrieben, da ist nichts anderes. Ja, und die zweite Frage war, wie man aus dem. Also, es ist ganz einfach, von dem Null eine Eins zu machen, weil man muss das einfach dann ein bisschen lauter, ein bisschen länger dann rausprojizieren, sozusagen. Ja, man könnte wahrscheinlich mit irgendwelchen Störsignal dann tatsächlich aus dem 1 und 0 machen, indem man diese, äh, diese Trägerfrequenz dann irgendwie kaputt macht. Äh, ja, dann müsste man aber lauter sein als... Äh, ersten Sender äh, und gleichzeitig äh, genau in die gleiche Phase dann ausstrahlen. Und also es, ich kann mir vorstellen, dass das klappt, aber es klappt nicht mit einem 5-Euro-Gerät. Uh, my question was, if you have uh, also found some more secure devices that are also still pretty cheap. I mean, Nowadays, it seems like there's all sorts of stuff on 2.4 gigahertz around, and maybe there's more modern doorbells. Have you found any of of those devices that are more modern and more secure? Uh, not with doorbells. So doorbells are universally cheap and crap. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are other devices that that have better security. Um, there's um, they're mostly targeted at the security market. So people are willing to pay more for, for more security. Um, and the way they usually work is uh, with a challenge response. So, so you have two-way communication. But already having two-way communication has dramatic impacts on battery life and on cost. So for the one-way communication devices, uh, even, even the higher frequency, fancier ones, are usually fairly insecure. Ähm, ich will noch was nachtragen zu dem, äh, kann man daraus Nullen machen? Also ich würde sagen, dass das sehr schwer ist, weil man genau die gleiche Intensität treffen muss und genau die gegensätzliche Phasenlage. Mhm. Äh, was ich mir aber eigentlich vorstellen könnte, ist, dass der ähm, Empfänger eine Art Gain-Korrektur hat, so dass wenn man einfach viel lauter reinschreibt, zehnfache Intensität, dass man damit dann halt mehr Sendepausen ähm, Nullen erzeugen kann. 
Ja, das kann man auch so machen, dass man ähm, einfach alles zu einsam macht, dass, ähm, dass der ganze Signal weg ist und dann was darüber strahlt. Also was danach ähm, zeitlich verschoben darüber strahlt. Und das ist viel einfacher, als irgendwie so, so viel lauter dann auszustrahlen. Ja, zwei Dinge. Äh, zum einen, du hast eben auch von den äh, Funkfernbedienungen für die Steckdosen mhm. gesprochen, die man schalten kann. Ja, die meisten setzen das gleiche Protokoll ein. Davon gibt es eine schöne Arduino-Lib, äh, äh, die man dafür nutzen mhm. kann. Und es gibt genug Projekte, die gesagt haben, ach, randommäßig schalte ich ständig mal im Haus alles ein und aus bei allen Nachbarn. Das gibt es schon alles. Ähm, ähm, bei den ähm, Autoherstellern, da jetzt meine Frage, ich meine, die Security-Sachen sind lange bekannt und das wäre ist so ein Fail, dass ein Autohersteller das überhaupt einsetzt. Äh, heute aktuelle Autohersteller, die das noch einsetzen? Ernsthaft? Hast du mal geguckt, wer das so macht? Also ich habe keine bisher gefunden, die nicht so einen Rolling Code hat. Also ähm, diese, diese Decoder-Hersteller... Den, äh, der Rat hat bisher keine Autohersteller, die ich kenne, befolgt. Also das ist schon mal gut so. Aber ähm, komplizierter als so ein Rolling Code habe ich auch noch nicht gesehen. Es gibt bestimmt welche, aber ich habe jetzt nicht viele durchgetestet. Es ist so the same uh, question going to the Rolling Code. Depending on the length of the code itself, you could just replay like all the numbers and then bring the key and the car you out don't the even need to replay all the numbers you only need to replay every 512 number okay because because the receiver is expecting the transmitter to to have skipped some codes in between it listens to a window of 512 different codes No, no, the codes change after each one, but um, after each one is invalidated, the window shifts. Mm -hmm. So you have 512 valid codes, mm -hmm. up to 512. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, whenever one of them is used, that becomes the start of the, of the next window. So you, you don't need to check every code, you just need to check every 512 code, and eventually you'll find one. Yeah, they're fairly long. They're, um, they're, um, I've seen 60-something bit codes. So it will take a while. But it is possible. If you had all night, you could definitely just run through every code. Are there more questions? I think we're done. Yeah. Then again... A big applause for climate. <laughs>